going to start off with a question. Let's see a show of hands. How many of you in the audience here tonight have experienced altitude sickness? Okay, that's quite a number of you. For those of you who are not familiar with the symptoms, acute mountain sickness, or AMS, is when after a few hours at altitude, you begin to develop a severe headache, nausea, dizziness, and extreme fatigue. If you stay overnight, the symptoms can include insomnia. And AMS is thought to be the precursor of high altitude cerebral edema, a life-threatening condition whereby the brain swells because the body can no longer adapt to altitude. Let's talk a little bit about what happens at altitude. Imagine that we've all been transported to the summit of Mont Blanc. Everybody take a deep breath in and let it out. The air up here feels colder, drier, and thinner. Breathe in again, and out. There's less oxygen up here. Soon, that's going to trigger an alarm in a little organ in our neck here, telling our body that our blood needs more, brain needs more oxygen. We're going to start breathing faster. Our hearts are going to start breathing, beating faster in an effort to get more oxygen into our blood and more blood to our brain. This effect is essentially the same in all of us. Yet, if we stay here at 4,810 meters, approximately 65% of us will develop AMS. Roughly 12% of us will require hospitalization for our symptoms. And approximately 2% of us, that's three people in this room tonight, will contract life-threatening high-altitude cerebral edema. And there's more bad news. Researchers have recently found out that exposure to extremely high altitudes causes permanent, irreversible brain damage. Those of us who get AMS may get the damage sooner and at lower altitudes. On a brighter note, here's my friend Liz. Liz is a super fit, strong, healthy mountain guide who takes dozens of clients to the summit of Mont Blanc each summer. But, like many of you, when she goes to high altitude, she gets acute mountain sickness. No matter how well trained she is, after a few hours, AMS sets in. And although she's strong enough to push through to the summit with a smile on her face, she occasionally has to stop and throw up. Okay, now how many of you have one of those really annoying friends who doesn't train very much at all, but is totally fine at altitude? <laughs> I do. This is Johnny. <laughs> Johnny is an investment banker who never sleeps, never trains, and parties hard. Now, Johnny's not exactly making speed ascents at high altitude, but he's not getting sick either. Why is that? Why is it that some of us get altitude sickness and others do not? And why is it that the more fit you are, the more likely you are to get sick at altitude? The answer? is that we don't know. <laughs> Scientists have done lots of research and have some very good ideas, but we have no conclusive answers yet. For a long time, everybody believed in something called the tight fit theory. The tight fit theory essentially states that the size of your brain relative to the amount of fluid between your brain and your skull is what determines who gets AMS and who doesn't. Here's how it works. So this is Johnny's brain. He goes to altitude, blood flow increases, and there's no problem. There's enough fluid around his brain that he can drain a little bit of it to compensate for the increase in blood volume. Now here's Liz's head. Her brain is larger relative to the amount of fluid and size of her skull. And thus when she goes to altitude, intracranial pressure increases and she gets sick. Unfortunately, once technology became sensitive enough to test this theory, it wasn't supported by research. We all actually have the same amount of ratio between the brain and fluid volume, regardless of whether or not we get AMS. After the tight fit theory was debunked, researchers from a whole diversity of fields started investigating things from genetics to hormones 
membrane permeability, electrolyte variability, scientists learned a lot about what happens to the brain at altitude. But there is still no clear answer. So some researchers went back to the tight fit theory. What if, instead of an anatomical tight fit, the tight fit was physiological, meaning that it wasn't a structural difference between Liz and Johnny's head, but a functional one. So they looked at blood inflow going to the brain. Maybe Liz was getting more blood sent to her brain, but no, blood flow is about the same in all of us. Then they looked at brain swelling or edema formation. And here some really interesting differences were found, but not until the very late stage of AMS and the clinical onset of cerebral edema. In the first 16 hours or so at altitude, we actually all experience minor edema or brain swelling to the same degree, whether we get AMS or not. And then suddenly that starts to change. So what's happening in those first 16 hours or so that's different, but different between Liz and Johnny? Well, there's one more physiological tight fit possibility, venous congestion, or what I like to call outflow theory. Here's how it works. Venous congestion means that although the increase of blood to the brain is the same for Liz and Johnny, in Liz's head, some kind of restriction is slowing down flow out of her head or outflow, causing a buildup of congestion within her venous system. So here's how that works, just to demonstrate. We've got Johnny first. So when Johnny goes to altitude, blood flow to his head increases, and there's no problem. Inflow and outflow are approximately equal, and Johnny's fine. Now Liz goes to altitude, and blood flow to her brain increases, but outflow is slowed down. There's a restriction, something limiting it. So congestion starts to build up within the venous system in her head. This causes pain, vestibular symptoms like dizziness and nausea, and eventually uncontrolled edema formation. Okay, so how does osteopathy come into all of this? How many people have been to an osteopath before? Great. <laughs> Do you remember your first time? What did you go in for? Your ankle. Okay, I'm going to bet that the osteopath asked you some questions, did some basic testing, then lay you down and started playing with your head, fiddling with your neck, mm -hmm. sticking their fingers in your ears. Did you get the fingers in your ears? Yes. <laughs> and you wondered what the heck they were doing? As an osteopath myself, I have seen that look of confusion on my patients' faces many times. <laughs> but don't worry, they weren't just messing with you. What they were doing was checking for circulatory blockages. Circulation is the primary concern of any osteopath. Before we start working on your ankle or your knee or your back, we want to make sure that all the tissues in your body, including your brain, get adequate and unimpeded flow and drainage. So I imagined a possibility between the circulatory blockage that could be at the root of AMS and the tools that I have as an osteopath to improve th flow through circulatory pathways. I created a protocol that addressed a multitude of structures that influence outflow or drainage from the head. There's a visual depiction of some of those structures, and I'll just highlight a couple of important areas so you guys get an idea of what I'm talking about. So for example, having a vertebrae out of place somewhere up here can apply pressure on a nerve bundle that controls dilatation of the blood vessels in your head. Wearing a heavy pack, as we do at altitude, could exaggerate that effect, meaning that what maybe just feels like tight shoulders or a stiff neck is actually changing circulation in your brain. Another example is that having too much tension in this muscle here can compress the jugular vein, which is the main outflow vessel from the head. Now, arteries also run through there, bringing blood to the head, but they're more muscular and thus more resistant to compression. But veins, you can kind of squish a little, meaning that all this tension that we hold up here 
can actually be slowing drainage from the head without influencing inflow to the head. So I had imagined a way to prevent altitude sickness, but what should I do about this idea? And here's where the magic of Chamonix, France comes into play, where this community of open-minded people with a rich diversity of skills and a passion for everything to do with the mountains turned an idea into a reality. I had the great fortune of connecting with Hugo Nespoulet and Arnaud Combre. Those are two researchers at Lifremont. And together, we created a project called TAIA, Alternative Treatments for Altitude Sickness. They were testing a mask that could work on symptoms once you are at altitude. And I was using the osteopathic protocol as prevention, performing it one week before exposure. We divided subjects into three groups. All of these subjects had a history of AMS, which is the biggest risk factor for getting it again. They were randomly divided into one group that got a real osteopathic treatment, but a fake mask. The second group got a fake treatment, but a real mask. And the third group, the unlucky control group, got a fake treatment and a fake mask. And at no point in the study did any of the subjects know which group they were in. The project received EU funding, and we were granted access to the Mountain Lab at the summit of L'Aiguille de Midi. When the Mountain Lab was created, it provided a really unique opportunity for altitude researchers. Scientists tend to be control freaks. And in most altitude research, trying to account for fear, sweating, sunglasses, it creates a whole mess of compounds that are really difficult to tease apart afterwards and interpret results. The Agreed Midi Mountain Lab is a brilliant solution to those problems. Subjects ascend passively in a cable car. No one gets scared, no one even needs to take an ice axe out. And we get to control everything. How much they eat, how much they drink, and how many steps they take. And that's a lot of steps. Our brave subjects spent 15 minutes out of every hour for 10 hours running up and down stairs at nearly 4,000 meters of altitude so that their blood oxygen desaturated faster and their likelihood of getting sick increased. Now, before I get too carried away with stories of this amazing mountain lab with breathtaking views and a commute home via La Vallée Blanche, let me show you a picture of the, the inside of the lab, known to those who work at L'Aiguille Midi as where we dry our boots. The reality isn't always as sexy as the dream, but researching at the Mountain Lab provided the opportunity to see many beautiful sunrises and to obtain some very interesting results. So we're gonna take a look at the preliminary results. On this axis here, we have how sick the subjects are getting. And on this axis, we have exposure to altitude as measured in hours. So here's our control group. And you can see that they're getting progressively sicker. In fact, many of them ended up being placed in a hyperbaric chamber or taken down to town for medical follow-up. Now here's the osteopathic group. And you can see they're doing way better. In fact, at no point during the experiment did anybody in the osteopathic treatment group get AMS. Keep in mind, they all had AMS before, like the control subjects, and they didn't know which group they were in. Our results become statistically significant from that point on. And you can actually see there's a little dip right there where everyone's feeling pretty good. They got a 15-minute booster treatment at around that time. For the mask results, you'll have to wait till next year's TED Talks. <laughs> Now, this is all really exciting for me, but what does it mean for you? Well, for those of you who raised your hands at the beginning of this speech, this could mean that you could avoid getting altitude sickness and potentially long-term brain damage just by going to see your osteopath before a high-altitude ascent or an expedition. Imagine, no more headaches, no more turning around before the summit from exhaustion and no nasty side effects from drugs. Just natural, manual therapy. And now what about those of you who don't get altitude sickness or who don't climb mountains in your free time? The possibilities extend to you too. If we can show that the protocol to reduce venous congestion works, 
then it can be used for a spectrum of other disorders, from congestive headaches, chronic fatigue, and migraines. In science, creating new connections between very different ideas is what drives innovation. My love of mountain sport is what brought me to Chamonix, and my training in osteopathy enabled me to imagine a possible solution for Liz and many of you here tonight who suffer from altitude sickness. Thank you very much.